Hey everybody, this is Tim with the University of Vinyl. I'm back today, and today, it's been about a month, I think, I wanna focus on one mastering engineer and five incredibly great sounding albums uh, that he mastered. Um, the guy I'm gonna talk about today uh, recently passed away this past August. He is a legendary figure in the mastering universe. Uh, his name was George Horn. Uh, based in the San Francisco Bay Area for a long time in San Francisco um, and then for many, many years in Berkeley, California as well. So today we're going to take a look at five classic rock titles mastered by George Horn. <laughs> In 1970, Clive Davis from Columbia Records decided to move west and Davis wanted to have a West Coast headquarters for Columbia Records and he decided on the city of San Francisco and there was a state-of-the-art recording studio on Folsom Street, uh, which is south of Market in San Francisco. It's no longer there today. I think there's condos there. Um, uh, interestingly enough, um, Francis Ford Coppola actually had offices, his American Zotrope offices were upstairs uh, from the recording studios. Um, that was known as Coast Recorders at the time, and uh, it eventually became known as the Automat as well, and they recorded there well into the early 1980s um, before it relocated. Clive Davis instilled George Horn as the lead mastering engineer for Columbia Records West Operations in 1971. Uh, he would stay there until 1978. He actually moved down to Burbank uh, to Ken Dunn Recorders for two years uh, before moving in 1980 to Fantasy uh, Studios up in Berkeley, California. Uh, and he held that post, I believe, for almost 30 years. He then started his own studio uh, in the old Fantasy uh, uh, Studios building uh, in Berkeley uh, in 2008. Uh, Horn is widely known and regarded as having fantastic ears and, and being able to kind of, you know, as a mastering engineer, you are the last line of defense for that recorded tape and that recorded material before it is uh, mastered and uh, lacquers are cut and, uh, and it's ready to be pressed into albums for the general public. And in doing my research, uh, George Horn is well regarded uh, as having a very, very good uh, sound stage for all of his albums. Uh, some of those were cut a little hot, um, but very, very nice EQ, um, very nice sound stages on these albums. And uh, the five that I'm going to focus on today are five of the better sounding original press albums that I have in my collection. They are all fairly easy to find and uh, they're all, of course, highly recommended. In 1972, Art Garfunkel was out making a movie with Mike Nichols and Jack Nicholson and Paul Simon was ready to release his first solo album. Uh, that is the self-titled Paul Simon. This is an incredible piece of work. One of my favorite Paul Simon releases. Uh, you want to look for that Columbia label and in the Dead Wax you want to find uh, the Dead Wax information in script form and not stamped form. Uh, those just sound better than the later um, pressings that uh, move to a stamped format. You want to find the script format. And first of all, I love the cover art. Uh, it's just Paul in the parka. Uh, and, you know, any album that has mother and child reunion and me and Julio down by the schoolyard is going to be a huge winner. But there are also many, many fantastic deep cuts on this album, like Duncan, um, Hobo's Blues, uh, Paranoia Blues. And 
the cool thing about this album is you can find this for between eight and fifteen dollars. You want to find this in VG plus plus to near mint condition. They're out there. Um, the, this is a dead silent record, and it is an incredible high fidelity roller coaster ride of an experience. Um, it is punchy where it needs to be, um, and. Paul's voice sounds amazing. This is a this is just a fantastic album by Paul Simon, released in 1972. Um, this is Paul Simon's. You know what? I think it's is actually officially it's his second solo album. He did release something. Uh, he recorded something in 1965. Uh, I think it was called the Paul Simon Songbook, which was eventually released. Uh, it did it. it it was not released for years and years and years. So officially, this is the second solo album, the first after the breakup of Simon and Garfunkel by Paul Simon. After Garfunkel finished uh, filming the, the film, uh, and, you know, which took a long time, and he was in Mexico, um, he eventually came out with his first solo album, and that album, of course, is Angel Claire. Uh, Portions of this album were recorded in the beautiful Grace Cathedral, uh, Russian Hill, San Francisco. And what I like about this is pretty cool. You've got a very kind of similar take as far as the cover art. Um, we've got art here, and then I previously showed the Paul album, but it's both themselves just front and center on that album. Uh, Angel Claire, one of the kind of known as one of the more lushly produced and great sounding records out there. These things are easy, easy, easy to find. Again, you wanna try and find this in VG++ to Near Mint, so it sounds great. Now, there are three singles that were produced from this album. Incidentally, this was the highest charting solo Art Garfunkel album, his very first. Um, I love Traveling Boy. Uh, I Shall Sing is a song by Van Morrison that Morrison never recorded, so it was written by Morrison. Uh, interestingly enough, there are two really, really kind of high-profile guests on the album. That's J.J. Cale, uh, who had the uh, guitar solo in uh, Traveling Boy, and also Jerry Garcia has some nice guitar work as well. Um, the... Biggest song off the album actually went as high as number five on the Billboard charts. And that, of course, is All I Know, the song written by Jimmy Webb. This is a fantastic Art Garfunkel record. Um, it's not my favorite in his discography. I actually prefer the album that would come next. Uh, that was Breakaway. But just for the sound quality alone, you should seek this out. And it's very, very cheap to find. Um, both this album and the Paul Simon self-titled album were co-produced by Roy Haley. Roy Haley is known as a stickler for sound. Uh, he worked on almost all of the Simon and Garfunkel albums as well uh, with Art and Paul. Um, so engineering was Roy Haley, but mastered by George Horn. In June of 1974, The Grateful Dead released... The Grateful Dead from the Mars Hotel. Um, very interesting aside here. A couple things to look at on this album. You want to try and find an original Grateful Dead Records um, release. That is um, GD102. This was the second album released on the Grateful Dead's own label. And you want to find one which has got the embossed authentic along the side. The reason they had the uh, embossed authentic is because uh, uh, Wake of the Flood, the first album put out on Grateful Dead Records, uh, the previous album, there was some counterfeit issues and they wanted to have this embossed authentic uh, on the cover. The other cool thing about this is there was an actual Mars Hotel. Uh, it was in the Mission uh, neighborhood um, now demolished. I think it was over on 4th Street. Um, and the other interesting tidbit here is this actually had an alternative title to the album and it's called Ugly Rumors. Um, that is right here. Um, 
it is kind of presented backwards, so you have to look uh, at the album in a mirror to be able to see that. Uh, but beautiful artwork. This was a fantastic album. Uh, it was recorded over a three-week period um, at that Columbia Records facility in 1974, uh, also known as Coast Recorders. Um, it was situated on Folsom Street. And, you know, when the Grateful Dead recorded this, they had been into their tour, tour, tour cycle. Um, they were just introducing the infamous, the famous uh, wall of sound uh, that were powered by all the, uh, the Macintosh uh, power amps. Very, very cool thing. If you haven't... Uh, if you're not aware of, there's a miniaturized version of the Wall of Sound that a guy, I think he's in Pennsylvania, has recreated. It's fantastic. Uh, he's got a Facebook page. I'm going to drop uh, a couple photos of that uh, in the video as I'm talking. Um, this song has many, many, many songs that are still being played by Dead & Company today live. Um, first of all, we've got Scarlet Begonias, uh, we have U.S. Blues, Wave That Flag, um, Ship of Fools is still being played as well, uh, Pride of Cucamonga is a Phil Lesh song, it is a fantastic listen, it's not played very often um, live, actually I think it was only played for a year or two after uh, this album was released. There is that kind of beautiful washed out blue label. Uh, don't forget about China Doll, fantastic song. And one of my favorites is Loose Lucy. Um, Garcia is in great form. The entire band sounds fantastic on this album. Um, that is from the Mars Hotel, released in 1974. This is an original pressing. A lot of people on the forums will say that this rivals um, the the newly uh, released Chris Bellman cut. Uh, it also rivals uh, the MoFi that came out. And um, you know, if you can find this clean, you're going to be pen, you're going to be spending between twenty five and forty five, maybe fifty dollars. Uh, but well worth finding an OG copy if you can. Mastered by George Horn. In November of 1975, Neil Young um, had an album in the can, as Neil does. He's got so many things going at the same time and juggling things. But in the fall of 75, he was ready to release Zuma. Uh, this is a Neil Young and Crazy Horse album. It is the first Crazy Horse album not to feature Danny Witten, tragically passed away. Um, you can listen to Tonight's the Night for more um, you know, input into that time period. And, and um, you know, that was a kind of a morose uh, album. Um, but he was ready to release what was going to be Zuma. And this is one of the best original pressing Neil Young albums as far as sound quality is concerned. Mastered by George Horn. Um, it's fairly easy to find, but it's tough to find this thing clean. I actually have a couple different copies. One is kind of dished, and the other has got some skips. So I actually am showing you the Bellman uh, reissue cut. Um, but if you could find the OG, a lot of people are saying the OG will beat the Chris Bellman um, reissue from, from Young. Now... A little more background about this album. It was recorded in two different places, the Broken Arrow Ranch, and then a lot of this was recorded at Point Doom, Malibu, California. Um, Neil's uh, producer at the time had a beach house that he was renting, and uh, I think half of the album was recorded there. They had found um, a replacement for Danny Witten. That, of course, was Frank Pancho San Pedro, fantastic guitar player. Um, went on to be a computer programmer as well. Um, finally has retired uh, over the last few years. Um, Nils Lofgren is back in Crazy Horse now. It's kind of taken the place of uh, San Pedro. But this was the first album featuring him, and it's an incredible album. 
Side one kicks off with Don't Cry No Tears. And then we segue into one of the premium songs on this album. First of all, Don't Cry No Tears is a fantastic, loose, um, rocking, um, country-ish. You know, it's a, it's a perfect Crazy Horse song. Um, Danger Bird is a very, very layered song uh, before we move into Neil's vocal. Um, one of the best Neil and Crazy Horse songs. And then I would be crazy if I don't talk about Cortez the Killer, uh, which is on side two. Seven and a half minute epic song. Um, every Neil Young and Crazy Horse fan, I would think, ranks Cortez the Killer probably in their top five songs, I would hope. It is a fantastic listen. Uh, love the artwork on the album. Um, look for that rough textured um, cover. Um, that's going to tell you you've got an original pressing. Um, this was really well recreated with the with the, the official Neil Young reissue. Uh, it was on that reprise uh, steamship logo, of course. That is Neil Young and Crazy Horses Zuma from 1975. In the winter of 1976, Jerry Garcia was ready to release another solo album. He, uh, this would be his third album, his third solo album. And um, before uh, moving on to Jerry Garcia band, and this was actually credited as Jerry Garcia. Half of the album features the entire Grateful Dead band, and the other half, what would become the first incarnation of the Jerry Garcia band. Famously, Ron Tut was on uh, drums with the, the JGB band, or incarnation at that point in time. Ron Tut played uh, drums uh, with Elvis for years, and also just recently passed away, I think, within the last two weeks. Um, this is uh, the Reflections album. Uh, it is just a fantastic album. It's got some of the most prettiest Hunter Garcia compositions um, ever, ever written and, and put down to tape. Uh, I am talking about Mission in the Rain, of course, one of my favorite songs. Um, they love each other. I'll take a melody. Um, just a fantastic record. And... It was released on that Rounder uh, Records label. These are fairly easy to find. You can find these and, and you're going to be paying between $20 and $40. Again, try and find a near mint example. So midway through the recording sessions, for whatever reason, things weren't clicking 100% and Jerry decided just to bring in the rest of the Grateful Dead. Um, and also I think John Kahn... Uh, the bass player uh, for the Jerry Garcia band, old and in the way as well, was, was involved in the recordings. Um, but the four songs recorded with Jerry, uh, with the Grateful Dead, um, comes a time, they love each other, it must have been the Roses, and the feel-good song might as well. That is uh, Jerry's third solo album, mastered by George Horn. And, of course, you know, Jerry Garcia had a relationship with George Horn. Um, Horn actually um, also mastered Shakedown Street, I believe. That is Reflections, the 1976 solo album by Jerry Garcia. It's a lot more than that if you dig into it and listen to it, though. Uh, four of these tracks feature the entire Grateful Dead. George Horn is also famous in the 1980s while uh, at Fantasy Studios. Uh, the Fantasy label um, was responsible for the original Jazz Classics uh, reissue series. Um, he kind of was overseeing that entire project. Uh, even today, some of these OJC uh, jazz titles on vinyl are very, very reasonably priced. Um, and they sound fantastic. So George Horn was part of that, uh, that whole effort with OJC. And um, the other interesting thing about Horn, he actually went and worked with Steve Albini, um, a lot of punk and, and 
let's say hard alternative stuff uh, in the middle to late 2000s. Um, and so he was, uh, you know, he, he took on all comers and uh, if we're talking classic rock, jazz, classical, punk, he, uh, he was not biased and he just wanted to serve the artist's work and present the best possible um, document uh, to the general public. That was another Mastering Engineer video. Thank you very much for watching. I'm going to be back soon. Um, I'm going to drop this video in my Mastering Engineers playlist. I have lots and lots and lots of great videos there. Uh, if you haven't um, seen all those Mastering Engineers videos, please check those out. I would really appreciate it. Uh, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button and um, you'll be notified when I throw up a new video. I will be back very soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.